So uh, I'm David Fawcett, Dr. David Fawcett, work with Seeking Integrity, wrote a book called Less Men and Meth that deals with um, methamphetamine and gay men and high-risk sex. And that is called ChemSex. It's one of the programs we're dealing with here at Seeking Integrity. Um, these webinars are all about addiction Q&A. And tonight, um, in lieu of Mental Health Month, uh, uh, which is May, I wanted to talk about a little bit about co-occurring disorders, because I think it's something we don't often talk about enough. And it plays a role um, in a lot of our lives. So I thought it was just kind of interesting to, to talk about that. And, and as with any webinar that we do, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction, but then uh, happy to go wherever the uh, group would like to go in terms of questions. Um, so we'll go from there. So in terms of what we call co-occurring disorders, co-occurring means simply having an addiction and having some kind of mental health diagnosis at the same time. It's a really, really common phenomenon. Um, just some numbers in the United States, about 43 million American adults have a mental illness of some form, ranging from mild anxiety or low-grade depression to uh, severe and persistent mental illness like schizophrenia. Um, and of those, about 10 million, one out of four are considered really serious, like the schizophrenia type. If we look at addiction, about 14 million Americans um, have a, a, some kind of addiction or use with drugs. And of those, more than half, 8 million, so 8 million Americans have both a mental illness and a substance use disorder. And those are the folks that we're kind of talking about tonight. Um, most often that ranges from um, what we call mood and anxiety disorders, meaning uh, anxiety, depression are the two most common for sure. Uh, and we find that um, some of those are really mo the most common probably with people that have uh, chemical dependency or substance use disorders. For people that have serious uh, mental illness, there's an even higher rate of addiction. So that, that would mean people who have schizophrenia, bipolar, other kinds of what we call thought disorders um, have much higher rates of addiction than even regular people. So um, it's something to really be uh, aware of. Just to quickly to go over some of the kind of mood disorders we're talking about, major depression, there's something called dysthymia, which is a mild form of depression. There's bipolar disorder, which is both the depressive and the, the manic sides of that. Um, there's the schizophrenia I've mentioned, anxiety-related disorders. Uh, there's post-traumatic stress disorder uh, of, that's considered anxiety, panic disorder, social anxiety, and so on, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. So all these things kind of often go together. And if they present clinically, it's really difficult sometimes to figure out what's going on, simply because the symptoms can mimic one another, uh, the, the uh, drugs can interfere with uh, how someone presents. For example, if I have a meth client who comes in, um, they can be really severely psychotic, hallucinating, look just like somebody um, with some kind of psychotic episode with bipolar or schizophrenia. And it's really hard to discern. So it takes a lot of um, working out assessment wise to figure out what's going on. Uh, and sometimes the people themselves have no idea either because the, the effects of the drugs and the mental illness get so intertwined that it's really difficult. So it's always a good practice uh, as a clinician not to diagnose any kind of mental health disorder until we have a handle on the substance use. So if somebody is actively using, uh, if I'm an alcoholic and I'm drinking actively, uh, it's gonna be real hard for me to um, discern or di differentiate any depression I have from just kind of a depressive effect of the alcohol versus a, uh, uh, what we call an endogenous depression or something that's innate. So it gets really complicated to try to um, to diagnose what's going on with people, both because the, the symptoms can be complicated and they can be masked. So what are some of the phenomena we see uh, with just examples of, of co-occurring drugs and alcohol and uh, mental health disorders? Um, we might have people who are anxious who want something to calm themselves down, so they self-medicate. We might have people who are depressed uh, or feel really low energy and lethargic and want something to help them feel more animated. Um, I see that a lot with people who uh, are amphetamine users. Uh, they're looking for something to kind of stimulate. Um, they get kind of addicted to the stimulation itself. Um, there may be people who are fearful um, of others and may want something that make them feel more relaxed or less inhibited. Uh, we see that with certain drugs that um, increase sexual uh, disinhibition, uh, like amphetamines, like alcohol. 
cocaine uh, and other drugs as well. And there may be people who are just in psychological pain and just want something to make them feel numb. Uh, and a lot of drugs, of course, do that very effectively. So these are all kind of examples of how, how these two conditions kind of interact with each other. Um, one of the problems with that, of course, is that if someone is using drugs or alcohol to self-medicate, they're not developing the coping skills they need to manage whatever their mood disorder may be. So if, if I have anxiety um, and I, I, uh, I'm afraid to go out and interact with people and I have a couple drinks to calm down, um, basically I'm not only at risk for developing and to become an alcoholic, but uh, I'm also not learning how to, how to deal with being anxious and, and more healthy coping skills for that. So that's one of the things we really see is that people have begun to self-medicate and gotten in trouble with the addiction and the underlying mental health disorder, if that was their first, never has been addressed. In fact, probably has only gotten worse. Um, so uh, that's one of the complications. There's other complications, right? Um, addictive drugs, uh, illicit drugs uh, can interfere uh, with, with prescription drugs. So um, if somebody's taking an antidepressant, that may be, um, uh, have a bad interaction with certain kinds of alcohol or other drugs. Um, if I have somebody uh, using methamphetamine and they're HIV positive, and about 50% of gay men who use meth are HIV positive, uh, meth interferes with the metabolism, metabolism of the drugs, the HIV drugs. So it's actually interfering and, and uh, has an, a, a bad drug interaction with their meds. So we see that a lot. Almost every drug, of course, has some kind of bad side effects. And so um, it's really a problematic uh, for people that are trying to get the benefits of prescription medication. Oftentimes the drugs they take, alcohol, other recreational drugs are interfering with that. There's another problem too, and that I don't see it as much, but I still see it for sure. And that is that a lot of recovery groups, 12-step recovery groups, really frown on any kind of medication. And I've seen people in meetings who really needed to be on an antidepressant. Um, because they had a severe depression and people in program telling them you're not really sober or you're not really clean. And that's a, as I say, you don't, you don't see that as much as we used to 10 or 20 years ago, but it's a real problem because if somebody needs that medication, uh, that is not good advice. And uh, it's not the role of the uh, peers in a 12 step meeting to say whether they should be on those meds or not. So that's something to just be aware of and uh, take heart. I've seen that happen with sponsors as well. And the final point I want to make about that is just that um, when you have a co-occurring mental health disorder and an addiction, they really need to be treated together. They really needed to be treated at the same time because we find, uh, I'll give you a perfect example, um, with, with methamphetamine, uh, the guys that I treat, and some of the sexual acting out and the depression that goes along with it. Um, if we don't get a handle on the drug use, uh, the sexual acting out and the depression is gonna continue. But if we sort of do the traditional model, which is to get the drug use under control and hope the sexual acting out or the, the mood disorder resolves itself, we're going to be um, missing out. Uh, and so I think it's really important to um, have those together. I, here's a call from Dr. Rob Weiss. Let me just get rid of that and hopefully, are you still there, Scott? Okay, I just hung up on Dr. Rob. Woo! Um, no, that's <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, so the, the, so we really need to take our time and be really thorough in, in diagnosing these problems because it's uh, after a while it becomes really hard to differentiate what came first, what the what is the effects of what, and uh, it gets to be kind of a real big mess. And so uh, it's something that takes time, it takes patience. Uh, as I mentioned, and for someone in recovery uh, to have managed their mood disorder or their anxiety, for example, with uh, alcohol or other drugs, to suddenly not have those as a way to self-medicate, they need to learn how to manage those uh, either with the appropriate medication or with other behavioral techniques. So it takes time and patience and, um, and a lot of good uh, clinicians, I think, to get through that. So I... Uh, maybe that's a little more clin clinical than I wanted to be, but um, I think uh, because of national, uh, the National Mental Health Month in May, I thought it was really important to mention because it's something 
traditionally in this country with our healthcare system, we have clinicians who are trained with mental health, different clinicians who are trained with substance abuse or addictions, and rarely do the two overlap. And so even the funding uh, for many years, we could get mental health funding from insurance companies, but they wouldn't pay for addiction. Uh, and they're supposed to now, but it still is a problem sometimes. So I think we need to kind of, as a field, as a clinical field, come together and really do some cross training. And as, as clients or uh, really to advocate for yourself as best you can in terms of uh, really getting a thorough uh, treatment for both uh, anxiety, mood, whatever mental health issue there may be and your addictive disorder as well. So that's my quick spiel on my little phone. <laughs> and, the, and the phone is working great, even if the computer wasn't. Um, we've got a question in the queue already, but I've got several that I want to ask you on this topic real quick. Um, and, then, and then we'll go to everybody else, or unless we get stacked up with questions in the queue and okay. forget about me. Um, you mentioned that it's, it's difficult to tell which comes first, you know, the addiction or the mental health disorder. Um, do you, is it usually more one or more the other, or we really don't know? Um, what's, your, what's your thinking on that? You know, kind of deal. I think typically there's usually some kind of mental health issue underlying addiction. And, and those are typically not, and we, when I say mental health, uh, it's often not the serious mental health disorders, but something like anxiety or depression, I think are the two common ones. Uh, probably most common that I see. And I think oftentimes people start um, using maybe alcohol innocently to, to manage anxiety or using a little bit of uh, caffeine to, to cope with maybe a low mood and, and they can progress to uh, amphetamines, stronger stuff. So I think oftentimes, it's not always true, but oftentimes it's the, um, the mental health issue that comes first. And people often self-medicate <coughs> And then, um, then it all kind of takes off and they get two, two problems instead of one. So do we, do we find sometimes that um, a mental health issue that has gotten worse in the addiction will sort of abate when somebody gets sober? Like if somebody started out with a little bit of depression, but then they drank and screwed up their life really badly and then they get really depressed, when they get sober, what happens to that addiction? Or the, uh, sorry, to the depression. depression. Yeah, so that, that can vary, but um, typically um, the, the mental health concerns, whatever they are, will worsen as the addiction progresses. And so you're kind of not only left with the orig original mental health problem, but you're left with all the complications of an act active addiction and all the wreckage of it and, and the um, problems. Um, I will say, though, in recovery, once somebody gets clean and sober or stops acting out in a, any kind of addictive manner, um, their chances of resolving that depression or anxiety or whatever it was originally are much better because then they have a real handle on things and they're living better and they're usually working. Um, part of this, by the way, um, I, I should have said this before, um, sometimes it's the best treatment for mental health disorder is not a medication. Right. Oftentimes, it's really useful to um, have some kind of talk therapy. In fact, the literature shows that the best outcomes for depression occur when there's both talk therapy and medication combined. So it's not one or the other. Uh, in fact, almost every medication now will say uh, that the prescribed um, protocol is to include some kind of interactive psychotherapy as well. So. Um, so to, to get back to your point, Scott, the, in recovery, people are often getting that kind of help, and therefore their, their mental health concerns are improving as well. Yeah. Um, feel free to ask questions, people in the Q&A, and I'll get to them in a minute, but i got a couple more I want to ask David. Um, one of them is um, we do, our doctors do tend to treat um, mental health issues with medication first, therapy second. Um, do medications also sometimes work with addictions? Uh, can, are there medications that can help with addiction, um, particularly if it's in conjunction with them? Um, uh, yeah, uh, I would say so for sure. Um, so if, if I have a, uh, an anxiety disorder and that I find myself using alcohol or 
marijuana or something to uh, calm my nerves. Um, there are medications for that that are non-mood altering that can help my anxiety. So I think that, that yeah, there's definitely uh, similar cases where that's the case. Uh, there, and another example, um, there's a class of antidepressants called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, that are very common, the Prozacs, um, and that almost everybody has been on them at one time or another. They're very safe. General physicians feel safe prescribing them. Uh, those are very useful for obsessive compulsive disorder. And so OCD can underlie a lot of addictions as well. So yeah, there are many things that are non-motor altering that can really help uh, yeah. in conjunction yeah. with therapy. SSRIs will also, um, for the sex addicts in the audience, um, will also lower sex drive. That's not a reason to go take SSRIs, but it's a side effect. Um, right, right. So Both sex drive and, and um, ejaculation will slow, slow that down as well. Yeah. Which yeah. for a lot of people is a problem with those drugs, but for somebody in recovery, it might be a benefit. Yeah, things, things just don't work as well. Um, there are certain mental health disorders um, the one I, that I'm familiar with, I, I don't have it, but I know that, that, that um, oftentimes people with it are misdiagnosed as sexually addicted. It's bipolar because when they're in the manic phase, they can act out sexually. It looks like sex addiction. Um, are, there, are there other issues besides bipolar that can fool us when we're diagnosing? Um, I think it's that, that manic phase uh, that we're... That, gives that kind of mimics that acting out. So I think if there's some other reason for mania, um, bipolar is, is one, that people can be manic without the depressive side of it. Uh, people can also, I've seen people who have manic symptoms that are organic, meaning they're caused by some kind of um, brain lesion or some kind of physical problem. Uh, uh, a lot of actually, um, Parkinson's uh, is a dopamine related phenomenon and a lot of Parkinsonian drugs with L-DOPA can actually increase sexual arousal. It, it's, it's really interesting to me because it's very chemically similar to methamphetamine um, and which has the same effect, kind of stoking up uh, arousal. So there's all these stories of um, kind of sexual activity in nursing homes from people with Parkinson's getting L-DOPA. Uh, and so it, that can be an issue too. So there, there are medical and psychological concerns that, that cause that. But I, I think you probably named the biggest one in terms of the mania and the bipolar, uh, which, which can cause people to act out and uh, act out in very strange ways, including sexually. All right, I have more questions, but <laughs> they're not all, this is not all about me, I need to stop. Um, we have a question here. Um, I'm a sex addict in recovery. I am looking for a sponsor. Can a sponsor be a good male friend who knows all about my addiction, but is someone who is not an addict himself? Or must the sponsor be an addict in recovery too? What are the responsibilities for someone who is a sponsor? Good question. Okay, so sponsorship is a really important aspect of recovery and the 12-step programs. Um, I personally think it's really important that a sponsor also be in recovery. Uh, I think in my own case, I, think for, I have uh, people I consider who are mentors and um, supports and guides um, in my own personal development, but they're not in program and I don't call them a sponsor. To me, a sponsor is someone who has worked the steps as I have, uh, as I'm working with them. Uh, they have some wisdom about the meetings. They attend meetings that I do. They see me. I see them, um, we interact, uh, they're a guide really on, the, on this path. So I think it's very important that there's a, a great deal of shared experience. That's, that's just my feeling. Um, uh, I have had people uh, have sponsors in different fellowships, which I think works. Uh, to me, sponsorship is all about kind of that personal relationship. It's someone that I look up to, someone who I hear in meetings that I admire and think uh, I like what I hear, um, someone who I'd like to get to know. Um, sponsors are not necessarily friends. They're, they are there to call you out when you need to be, um, but they're really there to guide, guide you. And, and to me, it's all about trust. And it's the trust I have in my sponsor that he has been down this path as well. And, and he knows what he's talking about. And I think that's tremendously reassuring to me. Um, I also know over the course of my sobriety that 
Um, a sponsor is, is not a marriage. It's not a lifetime commitment. Um, I've had sponsors who were a great fit at a certain point in my recovery and then became less so. And uh, I have a little bit of people pleasing in me. And so I, I kind of probably let it go too long before I pulled the plug and got another sponsor. Um, but, but so I think it, it's important to tell, I always tell people at this, um, you can uh, pick the sponsor that's right for you and that you may grow in different directions. But the important thing I believe is not to go without a sponsor. I've had people, clients who would um, go on and on looking for the perfect sponsor and not have one. And I think that's really cruising on thin ice because um, even a temporary sponsor in every meeting that I know of uh, has some kind of list or show of hands or something to get a temporary sponsor. Um, people who are available to take sponsees, I think it's really important to have somebody in your corner always. Scott, you, you have experience in this? Any comments? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, the responsibility of a sponsor is to um, provide guidance, particularly uh, when you're early in recovery. Um, you know, go to this meeting, go to that meeting. I mean, literally tell you what to do. Um, and, you know, to do that, he needs to be in recovery. Um, I'm a big believer in uh, always having a sponsor the same sex as you are, even if you're a gay man. I, I just think men on this level re relate better to each other, and women on this level re relate better to each other. I, there are exceptions. Um, so um, the real job for me of a sponsor is to walk a sponsee through the 12 steps. Um, the 12 steps are, you know, the program of recovery in A or NA or SAA or, or whatever, whatever program it is. Um, you know, my job as a sponsor is not to fix your depression. It's not to fix your financial problems. It's not to get you out of legal hot water. You, you know, there are doctors and lawyers and financial advisors who, who can do that. My job as a therapist might be say, call a lawyer, um, but I, I should not be dispensing legal advice. I should tell you how, how, to, how to walk through the steps. Uh, I, I let my sponsees go once they're through the steps. I'll keep them on for a few more months and then I say, okay, um, you need somebody for the next level. Um, I, I've done what I can do for you. Have somebody else walk you through the steps again if you wanna do it or, or whatever. Um, and you know, sponsorships tend to have a shelf life. Some people keep their sponsors forever. Some people don't. Um, I don't. Um, right now, I'm long enough in recovery, and I have enough people around me who have 25, 30, 35, almost 50 years, some of them uh, so sober, that we kind of sponsor each other now. Um, you know, when I have a problem, I know who to call. <laughs> um, um, I just have to be careful to not call whoever is going to tell me what I want to hear. I need to call somebody who's going to tell me the truth. Um, um, but, you know, for me, sponsors are about walking you through this 12 steps so that they damn well better be in recovery because otherwise they, they're going to have no idea how to do that. So, right. Okay. Right. Long winded. <laughs> I like that. You know, in Florida, there's this strange um, tradition of almost family lineages of sponsors. So we have a sponsor and people talk about their sponsor brothers and their sponsor uncles and it's like this whole family tree of sponsorship and, and which implies kind of this long lasting relationship. And I, I've stayed friends with my former sponsors, but they're not still my sponsor. I mean, I, I kind of would move with you. I, I kind of, um, you know, grow and move. And, and the thing is, if I'm not, I don't want to be fooling myself by, um, like you said, sort of calling the person that will give you the answer you want to hear. I think it's important to have somebody who's going to be, be straight with me. But um, yeah, I think it's, uh, there's, a, there's a natural fit with a sponsor and, and there's, a, there's a shelf life. I, I believe that too. Yeah, and you know, we, we have a lot of those families out here and you know, they have like big chili dinners and stuff. And I've been to a few of those and they're, they're really fun. Um, and it does become kind of a family. And that's why I always want to end the sponsor sponsor relationship, because if somebody has been with me a year and a half, they've gone through the steps, um, you know, we've done the work together. We're probably friends by now. Um, even if we weren't in the beginning, we are by now because we know way too much about each other to not be. Um, and, and the relationship moves to a different level and, you know, 
we need to take that step working part out of it. Um, yeah. Me. So different people have very different opinions on that. Um, so um, let me see. Um, ask questions, people. I've got a few more, which can carry us for a little while, but ask questions. Um, treatments. Um, you talked a little bit about the model was send them to addiction treatment and assume that everything else will be fixed or treat them for depression and assume the addiction will be fixed. Um, particularly the latter one, treat them for their depression or their anxiety or whatever it is and assume the addiction is gonna get fixed. Um, does that ever work? Um, I think it's really a risky strategy uh, because we know well, I think that approach is rooted in this fact that if I'm a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker that deals with, with mental health disorders, that's what I'm comfortable treating. That's what I'm going to see. And if somebody has another addictive issue and I'm not specializing in that, I kind of, first of all, I think I'm less comfortable with that. But I also tend not to view that as a primary or co-occurring, co-equal uh, illness to be to be addressed. So I think um, part of it, I think, goes back to the clinician and their comfort level and their, their knowledge base. Um, but I think it rarely works. Um, and sometimes we have to stage it. You know, if somebody is um, an alcoholic or an opioid abuser that needs a physical withdrawal, um, they're going to have, you know, 72 hours or three or four or five days of pretty um, uncomfortable days and nights and they're going to be agitated and not able to concentrate and so I mean obviously we have to take that into account somebody has to be treated until they're stable um, but I think my, my philosophy for treatment is that as soon as they're up and able they should be joining into groups and even if they have to sit there in their robe and group and you know with their eyes half closed and a little bit of slobber coming out I mean that's okay they're there in group so I think um, but I think it really uh, does any kind of service to the client to do that. I think a really full comprehensive assessment as soon as one's capable is, is really essential. Um, I do think there is some, sometimes you have to wait a little while before you jump in and start medications, for, like for an antidepressant, because uh, as, I, as I mentioned, an awful lot of drugs can create symptoms that look just like depression. And once the, the, the drugs are out of their system, those symptoms kind of abate. So I, I think it's useful to not jump right in with, with, uh, with psychotropic medications right away, but I also think we have to really start to assess from the very beginning of what might be going on with a plan. Yeah, and I guess the, the, my question was, you got a depressed person, how can you treat their depression when they're constantly self-medicating with alcohol or marijuana or porn or whatever? Uh, right. The, the, part of treating depression and trauma and underlying issues that we tend to see with addiction is is re-experiencing them and talking about them and working through them and is that even you know can you do that while you're actively addicted yeah i don't think so uh, i don't think so um another example is this whole chemsex thing that we're doing with people who are using methamphetamine and they're acting out sexually and uh, unless the two are so fused and bonded, unless you treat them at the same time, uh, you're really almost inviting the person to relapse on one or the other because the two are connected and you can't just treat half of the problem and, and hope the other will go away or plan to treat it down the road because the two are so interconnected. And we see that quite a bit. I think that's something that Seeking Integrity has a kind of a jump on that the field is starting to recognize that there's a whole different phenomenon of this paired or fused drug behavior connection that is like a, it's not one, it's not the other, it's kind of a, a new thing uh, that we're recognizing that I think is really important to, to treat as a thing uh, uh, together simultaneously, or else you're really doing a disservice to the client. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I also agree about, um, I, I don't wanna, talk too much about our facility, but we have a no smoking, no vaping facility because we want to treat all of the addictions at the same time. Uh, you know, we don't want people, there's a neurobiological element, which we've talked about. 
continuing to trigger the addiction. Right. Let me just say for that too, the nicotine, um, there are two drugs that are popular and legal that if they were brought to market today, I have every belief that they would not be approved. One is alcohol, uh, which is a really, really dangerous drug, but it's just, it's been legal. And so we kind of assume it's benign, but obviously it isn't. The other is nicotine. Um, nicotine is a really dangerous drug. It's, it's actually higher in the dopamine release. It's quite similar to cocaine. It's higher than sex, higher than orgasm, higher than any natural reward we can have, that toke of nicotine. But also even more kind of insidiously, it, it really trains the brain, trains that part of the brain that becomes addicted. Nicotine is like the perfect drug to train the brain how to do that. So if we have somebody uh, being treated for compulsive disorders or for any kind of chemical addiction to drugs, uh, and we don't take away the nicotine, it just keep, it's constantly keeping a little spark of activation and triggering it alive. And I think it's, um, it's a, again, it's a big disservice to clients not to treat that. And I think a lot of people balk, it's, a lot of people are horrified. A lot of people think it's a really great idea too. Um, but I think that's our, that's our stance. And I think it's a really important thing uh, for the benefit of the client. I just really strongly believe that. Yeah, it's, it's a research-backed stance. Um, you know, nicotine is one of the easiest things to get addicted to behind like meth and cocaine pretty much. Right. And it's one of the hardest to get off of behind meth and cocaine. Um, exactly, exactly. Very so, different. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about 12-step groups frowning on psych meds. Um, there's actually, well, I'm gonna, let me ask the question first. Why do some people think that if I'm taking my antidepressant every morning, which I do, then I'm not sober? I mean. So I think um, this is grounded in, in ignorance, frankly. Um, a lot of meetings, uh, especially maybe with some old timers, especially, um, are very rigid and to the point where if if I am an alcoholic and cocaine addict, at least in Florida, and in some other parts, rural areas in the United States, is still true. If I go into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and talk about my cocaine use, um, many meetings will shut you down, saying this is a this meeting is about alcohol, not cocaine, not sex, not anything. Uh, we speak about alcohol here, and it's that same mentality. I think if if someone is taking any kind of medication, um, even though it's not mood altering, those people consider that person to not be really sober. And I think um, I've seen this happen where uh, old timers particularly encourage clients to get off their, their antidepressants. And I've seen people get really, really sick. Um, so it's a problem, but I think it's rooted in not understanding drugs and what they do and uh, what they don't do. And I think it's that ability to um, differentiate between a drug that's mood altering and one that's not. Now, now I, I would object if somebody is coming to meetings uh, for alcohol, say, and they um, are using a lot of Xanax. Uh, that's a problem for me uh, because Xanax is a mood altering drug. Xanax is highly addictive. Uh, I don't believe they are clean and sober if they're using a lot of Xanax, because that's a, that's a way to self-medicate, a big time, big time way. And so I think we have to be a little more sophisticated in differentiating what the drugs are, people are or are not taking. Um, but to just say out of hand that somebody is not sober for taking an antidepressant is really, um, I think really terrible, actually. Yeah, no, there, are, there are horror stories about people listening to that advice and going off their meds and committing suicide or relapsing and dying in a car crash. And, um, okay. Yeah. Um, there's actually, um, in, I think it's in a book called Living Sober, which is an AA publication. Um, I think in the appendix, they actually address this issue and they, they're right up, they just say, we are not doctors. If we give you medical advice, run away and go talk to your doctor. Um, right. So, so I've learned to listen to my doctor, and you know, I hear horror stories about people who are having surgery, and they say, "No, I don't want painkillers," and the doctor looks at them like they're insane. Um, you know, I was in the hospital a couple of years ago, and the nurse kept trying to give me painkillers, and 
Now, I didn't actually need them. I was like, I'm not in pain. <laughs> but she thought I was being stubborn because I had told them right away, look, I'm an addict, you know, do not let me med seek. Um, but then I didn't take any, and she was like, no, you really, and I'm like, no. I'm... So we went round and round, but whatever. I'll tell you a little bit of my own story, too. I, I got sober in 79, um, and I didn't take a single pain med until 1994, when I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I was in the, in, in the hospital and resisting uh, pain meds for cancer. And it was just stupid. And I had a doctor come into me and said, look, you know, you're not, you're not being brave, you're not being crazy, you're kind of being stupid. And, and pain is not good. Pain is not good for your health. You know, we, we can treat it. And when you don't need it, we won't give it to you. And it was kind of, I felt like really guilty and like I'd betrayed something. But it, it made sense. And, and, and so in the, since then, what, 20 years later, 25 years later, I've had surgery a couple times or whatever, and I've taken pain meds for a couple of days and it's done. But I think um, there's nothing courageous about uh, being in severe pain. I mean, there's a, there's a point to pain meds. Um, I just always <coughs> make sure. That was the hospital, by, by the way. I always do safeguards, right? So the, those meds were prescribed in the hospital I didn't have them at home. It was kind of doctor regulated. Um, a couple of times after minor surgery, I had, um, they give you way too many pain pills, obviously, um, but I would give them to someone else and have them hold me. I never, even after many years of sobriety, I didn't want to kind of um, keep them myself. I wanted to be accountable to someone in terms of taking them. So that was kind of just a little safeguard that I built in. I felt good about that. Yeah, so I've been people, on the other end of that. I had a good friend who had a hernia surgery and it was a really deep and painful one. And I went over to his house every six hours, including in the middle of the night and gave him his pill because <laughs> that's how he wanted to do it. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, and that's what program friends and sponsors are for, right? The, yeah. Do... Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, since we're on the subject of medication, um, I see a lot of people who are, I think, and I am not a doctor, uh, but painfully over-medicated. And they, they'll, t they'll tell me what they're taking and what it's for, and it's, it's contraindicated. I mean, it's like, well, those are opposite. You can only have one, you can't have the other. But they've been to different doctors and the doctors just keep throwing medication at them. Um, do you see that a lot, David? Um, and what do you do when you see that? Um, yeah, well, first of all, I'm not a physician, right? So. Um, but I do see it with my clients a lot. Um, I treat a lot of guys who are living with HIV, and I think uh, that is one population that is typical of this phenomenon you're talking about, where I think doctors, first of all, thought, well, these uh, men and women living with HIV are uh, gonna have a lot of pain, their life is gonna be short, uh, let's give them whatever they want. And so I have clients come in, um, and they come in for meth and cocaine, uh, their HIV is stable, but they still have these standing prescriptions for pain meds and for Xanax and Valium and you know, benzodiazepines and uh, sleeping medications and all kinds of stuff. And I, I think that's pretty common where doctors um, in this country, I think have a desire to please. I think a lot of patients feel that they haven't really been served well unless they walk out of the office with a prescription or something. And so I think there's this phenomenon of doctors prescribing, that's what they do. Um, and, and that's where I think holistic medicine is where they might, you know, recommend a warm bath to calm down instead of giving them Xanax, but um, there are other approaches. The other problem, though, is that it's kind of what you're describing, Scott, where people are prescribed a drug, but no one ever looks at their whole list of medication and reviews it and takes something away. So there's this cumulative phenomenon where people just getting, keep getting more and more drugs. Um, I saw that with my, my elderly mother who um, went to visit and I just opened her medicine cabinet and couldn't believe all the stuff she was on. And it was just all these specialists who weren't talking to each other. There was no central kind of database of the drug she was on. And I, I do believe most GPs, the general physicians should at least once a year do a, a reconciliation of medication to, to eliminate those problems you're describing, but it, it just doesn't happen. And so, I've seen, I've seen drugs cause symptoms that lead to another diagnosis. Um, you know, there was a guy who 
had ADHD and he was a little bit depressed, so they diagnosed him with bipolar and put him on bipolar meds while he was also on antidepressants and ADHD meds, among other meds. And, you know, and when he finally went in to get sober, um, decided to go to a rehab, um, he wanted to know where to go. And, um, you know, there's, there's a place up in the San Francisco area that I know of that one of the things they do is they try to get everybody off all of the meds so they can do an evaluation. It, they, they specialize in people in this situation who, who, who've been diagnosed with everything. You can't have everything. It just doesn't work. Right. Um, but, you know, doctors were looking at symptoms that were being caused by other medications. He was taking Valium, so he looked depressed, so they put him on antidepressant. And he couldn't concentrate, so he, they put him on ADHD, and then he was up and down, so they called him bipolar. You know, he's none of those things. He was just an addict. Right, right. Sadly, I think that's all too common still. Yeah, oh, I see it all the time. I mean, that was the worst case I've ever seen up close and personal. Um, and he was crazy from the meds. He wasn't crazy as once he got off them. <laughs> but, and, and he was convinced that he needed all of those medications. But, you know, that's addict. Um, so we have another question here. Um, I'm going to have major surgery soon and was kind of worried about taking pain meds. Um, are there pain pills that I can take as a recovering alcoholic? Or, or, or some better than others, maybe, David, or less addictive than others? Uh, I know you're not a pharmacologist, but yeah, I'm not a you know more than I do. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I just, um, I would ask your doctor about that. I, I'd tell your doctor your, your situation. And um, I, I would focus on building in some of those safety mechanisms with who holds your pills, who's, uh, who's accountable for it, uh, make sure that, um, People know what you're doing. Um, there, I guess in general, I would say uh, of the pain meds, there are probably longer acting pain meds that probably aren't a good idea uh, as opposed to short term. But as opposed to specific ones, I can't really say. Um, so I'm definitely talk to your doctor about. I think basically all pain meds uh, are a little bit mood altering. Um, the, some of the literature, the false literature, um, especially with, with Oxycontin when they were trying to promote it, um, was that uh, if you weren't in pain, it wasn't addictive. Um, and if, if you uh, even were in pain, there was no mood altering effect and all, all that's kind of not true. Uh, so pain meds are pain meds, uh, but um, if you need them, you need them. And I would just uh, use them sparingly, but um, consult with your doctor, consult with your sponsor, but pain is not healthy. So if you need them, taken is my recommendation personally yeah anybody who has a substance abuse problem uh, i think one of the first things uh, one of the first things so we had a question about sponsor sponsees i always tell my sponsees you have to tell your doctor now call up leave a message say you want to talk to them i'm in recovery <laughs> so they know so they don't over prescribe um and when i have procedures which happens every couple of years at this age um i tell the surgeon and I tell the anesthesi anesthesiologist. Um, I make sure they know, and I, and I always have to tell the anesthesiologist because I haven't had anything in my system for so long. Give me the baby dose, please. Don't look at me and say I weigh 200 pounds and, and, and jack me up because you're gonna make me sick. Um, and sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't. And uh, I'm always grateful when they listen because they give me what I need um, instead of twice what I need which, you know, they're poking me six hours later going, it's time to wake up. <laughs> you know, right. That actually happened, you know. Right. So, but yeah, just make sure everybody's informed and use your support network. You know, just like David did and I've done for people here. Um, it's when people try to do it on their own that they get in trouble. Because people do relapse on pain meds, but it's because they try to do it on their own and suddenly they're taking four pills instead of one and they're getting it refilled three times. And, and I think that's another really good point is to really take them as prescribed um, because uh, a lot of times, you know, if it says one every 12 hours and if you're feeling uncomfortable and you may be after eight, some people, you know, an addict, the addict in me says, I should take another one and, uh, you know, double up on them. And that, that gets you in trouble fast. Uh, the other thing, and I think another reason to tell your doctor right up front is that, uh, they just, there's a ridiculous amount of prescribing 
uh, with these pills. I had a minor procedure a couple years ago. The doctor, and I told the doctor I was mad, but he, he gave me a prescription for 30 pain meds. And it was, I, had, I, had no, I literally had no pain. I, had like a, I took a, a, a Tylenol when I got home. And that was all. But it was kind of crazy. So I, I was grateful for the recovery I had because I could have really gotten in trouble with that. And I, I can see how people do get in trouble because pain meds are mood altering and they're powerful. And uh, if you have a bottle of 30 sitting there, it's pretty seductive. So I would really limit what you take home. Yeah, and, and um, one of the things I, I do for myself is I keep a list of questions that I have to answer. And, and I have, uh, in addition to depression, I also have uh, anxiety that kind of comes and goes. So I have an as-needed prescription because it can be really crippling. But I only take it when, am I able to function? If the answer is yes, no pill. If the answer is no, next question. You know, there, there, there's, there's six questions, and it just boom, 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 boom. And I have to answer no to all six of them before I can take a fail. Um, and basically, it, you know, it's when it's just utterly crippling and I literally am useless, um, then I'll give in and take the pill. Um, you know, and it doesn't get me high. It doesn't, you know, it just normalizes whatever's going on up here. Um, Right, that's a great screening, self-screening technique. I like that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, don't know. I should probably actually call someone and, and add that to the list now that I've recommended it to everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's so, great. That's great. Well, um, do we have any more questions from anybody? We've got a minute left. You want to you want to talk a little bit more about co-occurring disorders? Just kind of wrap it up and see if any more questions come in, David. Yeah, I think it's just um, it's just a natural phenomenon from people really trying to self-medicate, and and it starts out very benignly, where people um, uh, are trying to correct, correct the mood, uh, stay up a little bit. I think sometimes it some worries me with young adults in college who kind of routinely take Adderall or other prescription amphetamines to uh, before a test or to do a paper or to stay up all night, and just these are kind of what seems to be innocent um, patterns to kind of enhance, in, in quotes, our lives. Um, and that can really be, that can turn into addiction really fast and really, it can complicate. So um, I'd encourage everybody, and this is, goes with Mental Health Month as well, to really take stock of any issues you may have. If you have anxiety, if you have depression, if you don't know, um, check it out. Talk to your doctor, talk to someone, a healthcare provider, and, and get it under control because um, there's lots of ways to do it, uh, both behaviorally and with drugs. Um, as I say, we've talked about medication mostly tonight, but there's really marvelous ways in terms of breathing and mindfulness and relaxation and visualization, all kinds of ways to, um, that with practice are, uh, in some cases at least, as powerful as medication. So um, look at all your options. I think it's we always go for the drugs first in our culture, I think, but uh, there's other ways to solve the problem. But, but if you do have to take a drug, be conscious about it and monitor yourself as strong as you can. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, unless we have a last second question, um, we'll wrap up a couple minutes early. Um, David will be back next week and every week after that, uh, same bad time, same bad channel. Um, well, David will probably be back on his computer. That's going to work Hopefully. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and we will see you next week. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.